Welcome one and all to an evening with Leah Penniman. As Executive Director of Sustainable Woodstock and on behalf of our board and the co-host for this event, Pentangle Arts, I would like to say how very excited and delighted we are to bring you Leah Penniman's inspirational presentation, Black Earth Wisdom, as she weaves together the voices of today's most respected Black environmentalists. We are hosting this program from Vermont, so let us begin by honoring the Abenaki peoples and their homeland, Ndakina, this beautiful environment that we all love and which is here because of the wisdom and stewardship of the Abenaki and their ancestors, whose deep roots reach back more than 11,000 years. Our sincere thanks to our partner for this event, Pentangle Arts, and to the Vermont Humanities, whose support helped to make this event possible. Now I would like to introduce Sustainable Woodstock's Program Director, Ginevra Wetmore. Thank you, Michael. Uh, I'll reiterate that we are so very excited to bring you this inspirational presentation, Black Earth Wisdom, on this 53rd anniversary of Earth Day. This meeting is being recorded and you are currently muted. We will send a link of the recording afterwards to everyone who is registered for this event. A brief note about the schedule and handling of questions during the event. Leah Pennyman's presentation will run until about 5.45 p.m. We will then host a live Q&A session with Leah from 5.45 to about 6.15. If you have questions that you would like to ask at any time during the presentation, please type them into the chat on Zoom. Following the pre presentation, myself and our director, Michael, will present questions in the order they were received. This event is free and open to all. If you'd like to make a donation, we suggest $10, um, and they can be made through Pentangle Arts, our partner on the event. Please see the link in the chat, which will also be sent out in a follow-up email. Your donations allow us to continue to offer programming like this. I put the link in the chat, and we will definitely um, post that again and send it out, like Michael said. Thank you, Michael. So without any, any further ado, I'm going to introduce Leah Penniman. Leah Penniman uses all pronouns and is a Black Creole farmer, mother, soil nerd, author, and food justice activist from Soulfire Farm in Grafton, New York. She co-founded Soulfire Farm in 2010 with the mission to end racism in the food system and reclaim our ancestral connection to the land. As co-ED and farm director, Leah is part of a team that facilitates powerful food sovereignty programs, including farmer training for black and brown people, a subsidized farm food distribution program for communities living under food apartheid, and domestic international organizing toward equity in the food system. Leah has been farming since 1996, holds an MA in science education and a BA in environmental science and international de development from Clark University and is a member of the clergy in West African indigenous Orisa tradition. Leah trained at Many Hands Organic Farm, Farm School MA, and internationally with farmers in Ghana, Haiti, and Mexico. She also served as a high school biology and environmental science teacher for 17 years. The work of Leah and Soulfire Farm has been recognized by the Soros Racial Justice Fellowship, Fulbright Program, Pritzker Environmental Genius Award, GRIS 50, and James Beard Leadership Award, among others. Her books, Farming While Black, Soul Fire Farms Practical Guide to Liberation on Land, and Black Earth Wisdom, Soulful Conversations with Black Environmentalists, are love songs for the land and her people. And now, Leah Penniman. Greetings, community, and thank you so much for having me in your midst on this very special 53rd Earth Day. Uh, since I was a young person, Earth Day was truly my favorite holiday. I've been a devotee of Mother Nature um, since as, for as long as I can remember. And so it's very special to spend this day with you and a deep honor to share the journey that is Black Earth wisdom. And I'm going to uh, go ahead and share some slides with you to help take us through the storytelling of, of what it's been to rekindle this practice of listening to the earth in collaboration with, with brilliant black environmental 
leaders. So to begin, I wanna call some beloved ancestors into the space. And the first ancestor I wanna talk about is Dr. George Washington Carver, who many people know because he had thousands of inventions with the peanut. Uh, but fewer know why he was so enamored with this particular legume. And of course, it's because legumes partner with bacteria to pull nitrogen out of the sky and into the soil. And in a time after chattel slavery, when the soils of the South were so depleted by cotton monocropping, he had a, a way forward for restoring soils to health and became the godfather of the modern organic movement. Uh, he was advocating for composting and cover cropping. He was advocating for rotation of crops and, and mulching and silvopasture, you know, two whole generations before the Rodale Institute was on the scene. And his contributions were so immense that Albert Einstein called him one of the 10 greatest minds of human history. But what particularly tickles me about Dr. Carver is that when he was asked, where do you get all of these ideas, all these inventions, all of these, these novel ways of thinking? He said, well, every morning I go into the forest in the pre-dawn hours and I talk to God through the trees. He said, nature is God's unlimited broadcasting system through which he speaks to me every minute, every hour, every day, if I just tune into the right channel. And this was so deeply stirring to think of this renowned scientist, you know, one of the 10 greatest scientists of all time, who has a, a spiritual practice that involves talking to flowers, talking to trees, talking to soil, talking to the peanut itself to get input on how we move forward. And it got me really curious, you know, is this practice of earth listening part of the cultural heritage of our people? And it turns out that there are so many examples of ancestors who are earth listening. For example, Dr. Wangari Mathai. She was the founder of the Greenbelt Movement and was responsible for the planting of over 51 million trees as part of a woman's political movement, earning her the Nobel Peace Prize. Or Harriet Tubman, herbalist, orchardist, ecologist, and freedom fighter who liberated 70 enslaved people and cured Union soldiers using her deft knowledge of plants and landscape and sky. And so many more, right? John Edmondson, lover of birds, taught taxidermy and ornithology to Charles Darwin. Black scientist, Dr. Charles Henry Turner, uh, demonstrated for the first time that insects are intelligent beings. Hattie Carthen, tree planter, was a catalyst for the Brooklyn Community Gardens. And Hazel Johnson, community organizer and mother of the environmental justice movement. And you can see here this list of just a few of the hundreds and hundreds more of black elders who have contributed so much to the environmental movement. And I'm gonna ask you in this moment now to call in your own ancestors who had a relationship with the earth, or your earth listening elders, so to speak, and write their names in the chat. So we're gonna take a deep breath together. And go ahead and enter their names into the chat and honor them for their contributions to how we understand our relationship to the earth. Thank you, thank you. Hope Dean, Nimashu, Nilima, my grandmother, Roberta, my grandmother, Ella, Jerry Hawks, Ashe, Ashe, Asheo, we welcome them. So keep those names coming. But I wanna put forth that one of the great challenges of our time is that humanity by and large has actually forgotten how to listen to the earth. We're no longer littered in the languages of the earth and we no longer understand the deep kinship bonds that we have with nature. This was explained to me by one of the contributors to the Black Earth Wisdom book, Audrey Peterman, who's a Jamaican American elder. She's a lover of the national parks. And she put it well that she explained that there was once a time when everyone could read the sky, right? They could tell directionality. They could tell seasons, weather, the stories of their people and the patterns of the stars, the calendar, which way to go by reading the sky. You know, in other words, the sky was a primary source. But society has come to rely on secondary and tertiary sources further and further away from the sky in order to get our information a dangerous and distorted game of telephone yielding scrambled messages. And there are 
so many languages that the earth has, so many primary sources for us to read, right? As a farmer myself, there was once a time when farmers all knew that you plant corn when the oak leaves are the size of a squirrel's ears. That's when the soil has warmed enough, right? But the earth speaks not just in oak leaves or a sky, the earth speaks in ice cores, the pH of the ocean, bird song, gravity, tree rings, animal tracks. If I were to tell you that I lived in a neighborhood my whole life and didn't learn the names of the people next door, you might have some fair judgments of my character. And yet here we are in a neighborhood of trees, insects, and amphibians that many of us cannot call by name. And what we cannot name, what we do not know, we also cannot love and protect. As a young adult, I spent months studying agriculture in Ghana, West Africa, which is one of my ancestral homelands. And my mentors were these uh, wonderful women pictured here. They're the queen mothers of Manya Krobo, guardians of history, culture, and land. And they asked me one day, you know, is it true that in the United States, most farmers put a seed in the ground and they don't pray or dance or sing or pour libations or even say thank you to the seed. And then they expect it to grow and nourish them. And when I admitted that this is by and large true, they said, well, you know, no wonder you're all sick, right? You treat the earth as a thing and not as a relative. And I wanna put forth that this non-kin thinking is what leads to both racialized oppression and earth ravaging. It's the severing of family and the relegating of others to non-person that makes possible the enactment of violence and the oppression on others. So embedded in the theory of white supremacy is the theory of human supremacy over nature. And non-kin thinking, there's nothing inevitable about it, right? It's a uniquely Western invention and a relatively new one at that in the vast expanse of, of, you know, of human history. Uh, perhaps best described by Senator Thomas Hart Benton in 1846, who dubiously asserted, it would seem that the white race alone received the divine command to subdue and replenish the earth for it is the only race that has obeyed it, the only race that hunts out new and distant lands and even a new world to subdue and replenish. And the consequences of this twisted non-kin thinking are dire. It's ever, utter devastation, it's deep trouble, right? We know that species are in trouble. We're currently experiencing the Holocene mass extinction, which is the most rapid loss of biodiversity in the history of this planet, with 1 million species threatened with extinction in the coming decades. Scientists monitor, monitor carefully about 21,000 populations of, of mammals, fish, birds, and amphibians worldwide, and there's been a 68% decline in those populations in just 25 years. According to one of the Black Earth Wisdom contributors, Dr. Drew Lanham, who's an ornithologist, there are 3 billion fewer birds singing now than there were in the last century, right? Our seeds are in trouble, right? As farmers and gardeners, this especially concerns us. We've lost 75% of the world's crop varieties in the past 100 years, and the proprietary seed market count, accounts for almost all of our global seed supply, with Monsanto, renamed Bear, and DuPont owning the largest shares. Our oceans are in trouble. 90% of global fish stocks are fully exploited or overfished and agricultural, agricultural runoff and manufacturing waste has led to over 400 dead zones worldwide. And a dead zone um, is a place where the oxygen levels are so low, it's hypoxic that, that the fish can't breathe, that they suffocate to death. Microplastics in our sea now, now outnumber the stars in our galaxy 500 fold right? The climate is in trouble. Soil tillage, deforestation, the burning of fossil fuels have increased greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and earth's temperature has raised. It's why there were droughts on my farm last year and floods two years ago, why the buds and the flowers are bursting too early and the, the late frost will come, right? So we're already seeing the impacts of this. We know the glaciers are in retreat, the oceans are acidifying, and extreme weather events are increasing in intensity and frequency. People are part of nature as well. So these impacts affect people as well and not equitably distributed. You know, African-American communities and other communities of color continue to be disproportionately burdened with environmental harm. So things like air pollution, flooding, heat exposure, living in proximity to chemical facilities and leaded pipes and trash incinerators disproportionately fall on communities of color. And the EPA just put out a study in 2021 that shows that we actually haven't made that much progress 
um, since the 70s in terms of, of correcting environmental racism, uh, which is, it's troubling um, to say the least because there's been huge amounts of efforts on the part of communities of color to bring these to, to the attention of the nation and even the globe. You know, for example, predominantly African-American residents in Louisiana's Cancer Alley are exposed to emissions from 150 oil refineries and, you know, have disproportionate uh, burdens of cancer as a result. And it's not just the environmental uh, burdens and pollution. It's also, you know, not having access to nature, not having access to environmental benefits. So that we know that green spaces heal, you know, studies have shown that hospitalized patients heal when they can see nature and that people solve problems better after time in the forest. There was this, this really stark nationwide study of 900,000 people that showed that children who grew up with the lowest access to green space, even when corrected for all other measures, have 55% higher risk of developing a psychiatric disorder. And yet in communities of color, you know, 74% of children are growing up without in nature deprived areas, right? Without access to adequate green space compared to just 23% of white communities. And this is mirrored in, you know, in the, the story of like land bleeding out from the black community. You know, we know that Black households once owned a total of 16 million acres of land in the early 1900s, which was 14% of the nation's farms. But uh, the backlash against Black land ownership in the early 1900s was brutal, to say the least, you know, between lynchings and USDA discrimination and land grabbing and driving people off their land. We've had a near total loss of, of that land base. And so today, 98% of agricultural land is white owned. And these disparities, you know, in some ways shouldn't come as a surprise when we talk about environmental harms disproportionately burdening communities of color, environmental benefits disproportionately being um, inaccessible to communities of color. You know, in many ways, the, the environmental movement was, the Western environmental movement was created on a foundation of white supremacy. So what do I mean by that? Well, we'll look at the US national parks, for example, Harold is heralded as America's best idea. Uh, there's 84 million acres of parkland in the United States and it was stolen from native communities through forced treaty agreements under the genocidal product, project of Manifest Destiny. And Madison Grant was instrumental in creating some of these parks such as the Everglades, Olympic, Glacier and Denali national parks. He did so as a way to strengthen the Nordic race. He wrote a book about this in 1916 called The Passing of a Great Race, which Adolf Hitler referred to as his Bible. The first head of the US Forest Service was on the advisory council for the American Eugenics Society. And John Muir, who founded the Sierra Club in 1892, referred to black and indigenous people as dirty, lazy, and uncivilized. James Audubon, a famed ornithologist and scientific illustrator namesake of the Audubon Society, enslaved people and stole human remains for a pseudoscientific study claiming white superiority. So the National Park Service, you know, originally operated under Jim Crow laws that, that banned black and brown people from coming in. And even as that changed over time, uh, the de, de jure segregation changed over time, de facto segregation has remained. So 70% of black people participate in the types of recreational activities offered in national parks, yet less than 2% of the visitors to national parks are African-American. And you know, this even impacted our beloved Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Coretta Scott King. They were planning a vacation to Fundy National Park in New Brunswick, Canada in 1960 and anticipating that this public park would be a welcome and safe space for them to seek temporary refuge uh, from the stress and bustle of urban civil rights work, they nonetheless reached out in advance to make sure they would be admitted. So their, their friend, Harold DeWolf, uh, BU professor and friend of the Kings wrote to the park innkeeper saying, you know, Canada's history being what it is, we're confident you would treat them well, but we wanna make sure the friends of whom I speak are fine Negro minister and his wife, Dr. King. And the innkeeper responded, we feel it would be better not to accommodate your friends. But as I mentioned, right, in the face of big trouble, our people have always risen and resisted, always, right? 
and your people too have always risen and resisted, right? When the Olin Corporation dumped 4,000 tons of DDT into the waters of Triana, Alabama, Black residents sued and forced remediation and compensation. Community members resisted the Whispering Pines landfill in Houston, Texas, and the Warren County, the famed Warren County hazardous waste landfill in North Carolina on the basis of environmental racism. And out of these early struggles, they formed the first National People of Color Environmental Leadership Summit in 1991 and wrote the 17 founding principles of environmental justice, which still guide the movement today. And among these principles, there was an affirmation of the sacredness of Mother Earth, uh, a repudiation of discriminatory public policy, the uplifting of native treaty rights, among other provisions. And Black farmers were part of this too. You know, they literally rode their tractors onto the mall in DC demanding justice for their lost land and farms and suing the federal government for discrimination in the famous Pigford case. Uh, and, and something that strikes me is there's, you know, there's a prejudice to the contrary. You know, people often think that, you know, folks of color aren't concerned about the environment, but the reality is that black and brown communities are significantly more concerned about climate change and other environmental issues than the community at large. For example, 49% of white people are concerned about climate change compared to 57% of black people and 69% of the Latina community. And one of my wonderful contributors, Steve Kerwin is a great example of this. Um, he's the host of and producer of Living on Earth. And back in 1990, when 85% of the public did not even register the notion of global warming, Steve Kerwin proposed a radio show on climate. And his producers laughed at him and said he would run out of stories in six months. Well, I grew up with living on earth and it, it is on the air um, to this day. Bittersweet, of course, right? So like Mr. Kerwin, there are so many who persist in believing, right? That the land and water are family members and who, you know, have continued to cultivate that sacred art of listening to the earth to know which way to go. So the Black Earth Wisdom book project was a journey of learning from those whose skin is the shades and colors of soil as they share lessons from the earth. So I spent the past few years talking to 40 notable Black ecological thinkers. I got to talk to Alice Walker, Adrian Marie Brown, Ross Gay, Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson, Rue Map, Carolyn Finney, uh, Ibrahim Abdul-Martin and, and many others in order to learn, like, what is the earth saying to us in, the, in this urgent time? And copious tears of reverent joy just fell all over my keyboard as I typed their words. And while they offered many lessons that were quite myriad and complex, I want to distill just nine central motifs for you today that answer the question of like, what do we learn when we listen to the earth? What do we learn when we read the earth? What do we learn when we uh, reweave ourselves into kinship with the earth? So the first lesson that came out of the nine is, is that all beings are sacred. So in Yoruba cosmology, natural forces such as trees, rivers, birds, and hills are deities to be worshiped. There are at least 73 species of trees that are deified. And according to Awishe Agbai Wande Abimbola, who is the spokesperson for IFA for the world, there are forest areas in Yoruba lands called Igbo Etile, where no hunting is permitted, and Iluju Boboforo, where only spiritual and magical activities are allowed. So this idea of a set aside of land is a, an ancient millennia old practice in West Africa. I see someone shouting out Brother Yusuf Vergas. He's like a friend of mine. So thank you for doing that. Um, and also in Islam, right? There are many black communities that interpret the Quran as such that Islam honors the concept of taweed, which is the oneness of God in creation, ayat, the seeing of signs of God everywhere, khalifa, being a steward of the earth, and mizan, living in balance with nature. So according to Ibrahim Abdul-Mateen, the entire earth is a mosque. There's unity of spirit and matter and a sacredness imbued in all things. He shared with me that nature is in constant prayer. So the trees, the birds, the grass is in prayer. And when you destroy nature, not only are you destroying the material, but you're destroying a voice of prayer. The second lesson is that there's a covenant of moderation between all species, right? All life on earth shares this narrow band of habitability that extends from the deepest roots of trees and the dark environment of ocean trenches 
up to the highest mountaintops. And this layer called the biosphere is only about 12 miles from top to bottom, about 0.3% of the planet's radius. And yet here we are, right, tasked to share this tiny life raft with all beings. And there are a couple of Yoruba stories uh, that speak to this. So in the, in the Yoruba sacred literature, like the Bible, you know, but oral of the Yoruba people, there's a, a book called Ogbe Odi that talks about the consequences of using excessive force in our relationship with other creatures on planet Earth. So as the story goes, um, the characters are Mr. Byforce. Uh, so Mr. Byforce is like the bad guy um, who's using force and deception. And then there's his friends, grasshopper, hen, wolf, dog, hyena, viper, walking stick, fire, rain, drought, and dewdrops. And then he invites, uh, Mr. Byforce invites all of his friends to a collective work party on the farm. And each of these friends agrees to come so long as their sworn predatory enemy is not present. You know, for example, hen likes to eat grasshopper. So grasshopper's like, I'll come, but not if hen's there, right? And the wolf likes to eat the hen. So the hen's like, I'll come, but not if the wolf is there and so on. So Mr. Byforce gave false assurance, but in fact invited all of these creatures to the collective work party and lined them up so they were next to their sworn predatory enemy. And then didn't follow the custom of giving them ample food and drink while they labored on the farm. So they were toiling, they were hungry, they were irritated. And eventually when they just couldn't withstand their hunger any longer, they dropped their tools and pounced on one another, gnashing and biting. Fortunately, dewdrops, the only one among them without an enemy, fell upon them all and brought coolness. And this coolness restored them to their senses and they started to assist one another in rising to their feet, embracing one another, and agreeing to re-enter into the covenant um, that started at the dawn of time. And that covenant is to only eat what is absolutely needed, to only take what is needed. It's a covenant of moderation and mutual regard. So in this verse, dewdrops are the manifestation of Arumila, who is the deity of wisdom. And the story ends, doing things by force has ruined the world of today. Dewdrops come and make repairs. Dewdrops come and make amends. So this, this original covenant of moderation um, came about in the first age of the world, which is an age called Oba Jomi Jomi, the age of water. And it was an age when uh, all creatures spoke the same language, according to um, the sacred literature. As society became more settled, we entered Oba Jegi Jegi, the age of wood. Um, we are now in the age of Oba Jeon Jeon, the age of consumption, characterized by industry and greed and exploitation. And if we make it, the final age is supposed to be Oba Ero Ero, the age of the antidote. The third lesson is that nature is cooperative and generous. And this one touched me deeply. As someone who studied science in university, we are taught that it's all about competition, sort of this reductionist uh, interpretation of survival in the fit of the fittest. But the reality is that nature centers cooperation over competition um, in most circumstances. In fact, 90% of species on earth rely on mutualistic interactions to survive. Um, interactions like plant between plants and mycorrhizal fungi, uh, which provide them with inorganic compounds and trace elements. I'm, I'm sure this crowd knows about the work of Susan Simhard, which is, has um, put scientific proof on what indigenous folks have known, but you know, the, the forest is a super organism. The trees are sharing sugars and minerals and messages with kin and non-kin. They have each other's back in ways that we are only beginning to understand, right? Um, seed dispersal mutualisms, pollination, uh, even the very eukaryotic cell in our bodies is a result of symbiogenesis between two prokaryotic cells, right? And, and creatures help each other out. Um, this is kind of gross, but cool. So vampire bats actually regurgitate their own blood to prevent other bats from starving in their community. Um, ground squirrels, velvet monkeys, and prairie dogs will cry out to warn their peers of predators, even when drawing attention to themselves will increase their chances of being eaten. Ants and bees die for their colonies. Even the V, my v formation when birds migrate is a way of supporting one another um, and protecting one another from the wind. So, you know, if you think about the human body uh, in our trillions of cells, the majority of them are actually non-self. The majority of them are bacteria and we couldn't live without our bacteria symbionts. And scientists are now having to rethink the very idea of an individual 
um, because multi multicellular organisms and their symbiotic microbes are regarded as cohesive units acted on by natural selection. So this is like some big sciencey words, but you know, fundamentally we're talking about non-self, like the dissolution of the individual interdependence, right? As, as the fundamental way that nature has organized itself. The fourth lesson is that nature is really queer and trans, right? And, and this is important to bring forward because so many people will use an argument, a false argument of naturalness in order to defend uh, homophobia and transphobia, which, which is not um, accurate. So at least 90% of flowering plants are bisexual. They have both male and female reproductive organs. There are over 450 species of animals worldwide where scientists have documented same-sex intimacy, including courtship, pair bonding, affectionate touch, intercourse, and parental activities. So among birds, queer love has been seen in black swans, albatrosses, blue ducks, mallards, penguins, vultures, and pigeons. Mammals that, intimate, that regularly exhibit gay intimacy include dolphins, bisons, bats, elephants, giraffes, marmots, lions, bonobos, macaws, orangutans, monkeys, sheep, and hyenas. There are queer lizards, there are queer tortoises, even among insects and arachnids, dragonflies, fruit flies, and bed bugs have same-sex relationships. The fifth lesson is that nature does not have capacity to hate. Uh, in an 1873 speech, Frederick Douglass remarked, the grand old earth has no prejudice against race, color, or previous condition of servitude, but flings open her ample breast to all who come to her for succor or relief. And this remains true, right? In the face of racialized brutality, health crisis, or collective pain, Black people can continue to go and lay our burdens down by the riverside and nature will accept. The flowers don't close and shun and turn their backs based on the color of anyone's skin. Nature has this endless capacity to compost our trauma into hope and receives each one of us as her child. Uh, Drew Lanham testified, the land did not hate, only people did. Earth never judged or spat. Not a single cardinal or oven bird has ever paused in dawn song declaration to ask the reason for my being. The sixth lesson I want to share with you is a hopeful one because there are at least two languages that all of us still speak in common with the earth, even if the others have been forgotten. And this chapter is dedicated. My youngest son, who's about to graduate from high school, is a, a musician. So he's like, mom, you got to put something about music in that book. So this is the music chapter. Um, so the two languages of the earth that we still speak are song and silence. Uh, humans learn to sing from the earth. For example, birds use many of the same rhythmic variations, intervals, and combinations of notes that humans do. They follow the same scales, they sing in canon, they even transpose their motifs into different keys. For example, the ruby crowned kinglet taught us our full octave interval, the canyon wren taught us our chromatic scale, and the hermit thrush provided for us our pentatonic scale. The California marsh wren teaches us call and response songs and fixed sequence themes. Uh, the songs of the Hutu and Tutsi people of East Africa, their scales mimic the scales of the elephants who use ultra low frequency tones. And the indigenous people living on Tana Island in Vanatu created their songs and dances based on the sounds of the active volcano, uh, volcano Mount Yasser. So song and silence. Um, according to Toy Scott, the Mbuti people of the Congo deeply value silence alongside music. They think of the forest as talking and the quiet pauses between the sounds in the forest are called ekimi, which are the source of peace. And in ekimi, there's space for the wisdom of the ancestors and spirit speech. And I like to think that um, John Francis Planet Walker somehow caught this memo uh, through the ether. So uh, for folks who don't know John Francis Planet Walker, really amazing African-American elder and environmental activist. And after witnessing the devastation of the 1971 oil spill off the coast of San Francisco, John Francis decided to give up motorized transport on the spot, a commitment he kept for 22 years. And he additionally took a vow of silence that lasted for 17 years, during which time he walked across the nation 
advocating for environmental protection. And he earned a PhD in land management while um, in silence. And he wrote the Landmark Oil Spill Act of 1990. In the book, Lori Land, Shelton Johnson summed this up beautifully. He said, wilderness is just a word. And the wind got no use for anything that come out of our mouths except songs or prayers. Only then are we speaking from our hearts and worth listening to. Otherwise, we should just be quiet and let the trees and sky do the talking. The wind's been talking since the world began. I've been listening since I was born and I ain't bored yet. The seventh lesson is that land is the basis of freedom. Malcolm X said, revolution is based on land. Land is the basis of all independence. Land is the basis of freedom, justice, and equality. Right. The black community of Falls Church, Virginia, wrote to the Freedmen's Bureau in 1865 at the end of the Civil War saying, we feel it is very important that we obtain homes and the ground beneath them, that we may raise fruit trees concerning which our children can say these are ours. So this yearning for land has been a steady drumbeat in the heart of the Black community, not just because of home or not even just because of food or trees or even because of intergenerational wealth transfer, but because land is a source of belonging, of cultural continuity, of self-determination and of stability. I was struck by um, something, one of the contributors, Mama Savvy Horn, who's a, a lawyer who helps with black land laws. She told me that there were emancipated freedmen who returned to the plantation solely because they found they could not live without a particular grove of trees. And yet nearly all the black land that's ever been held in this country has slipped away, right? Through government discrimination, white supremacist violence, erasure of the legacy of non-owning caretakers, and more recently just disappeared under the rising coastal waters of climate change. And land is the only real wealth, right? It's, it's the gardens, it's the home provisioning, it's the, the varieties of collard seed and Maruga Hill rice seed. And, you know, scientific studies back this up. Like people who have land live longer. People who eat African traditional diets that you can grow on the land, like leafy greens and roots and tubers and legumes and ferments and whole grains, they live longer. So land is actually, it's, it's health and it's life. So the eighth lesson um, that came out collectively was this idea of our, our collective breath, um, that we're united by breath and also united by the struggle for breath. So, you know, majestic rainforest trees often get all the credit for providing the oxygen, uh, in our atmosphere. But the reality is that the oceans are more aptly titled the lungs of the earth. It's the ocean creatures, mostly phytoplankton, that produce over half of the oxygen we rely upon to breathe. But the phytoplankton themselves are struggling to breathe. They're, they're declining about 1% every year as the waters of the ocean warm. And they're not the only creatures gasping for air, right? Black and brown people and forest creatures you know, choked by wildfires, washed away by hurricanes. You know, according to Kendra Pierre-Louis, her greatest fear as a journalist is that we've just gone numb to mass death. The first few hundred deaths raised alarm, but the millionth doesn't make the news. I mean, Eric Garner cried out 11 times, I can't breathe. Who was listening? Ross Gay uh, wrote a poem about this, which says, a small needful fact is that Eric Garner worked for some time for the Parks and Rec Horticultural Department, which means perhaps that with his very large hands, perhaps in all likelihood, he put gently into the earth some plants, which most likely some of them in all likelihood continue to grow, continue to do what such plants do like house and feed small and necessary creatures, like being pleasant to touch and smell, like converting sunlight into food, like making it easier for us to breathe. And the, the ninth and final lesson that I wanna share with you um, in this summary of, of the Black Earth wisdom of these contributors is, is the idea that we actually are kin, right? Um, we're taught that our dignity comes from setting ourselves apart from earthly beings, better than apart 
and apart from animals and plants. And this is perhaps, uh, if you follow, follow this um, beautiful, but a little bit uh, challenging concept by, by Dr. Joshua Bennett, who's a wonderful poet and book contributor. He was explaining to me how one of the, the ways that enslavers attempted to demean and demoralized um, enslaved black people was by comparing us and treating us as animals, uh, as oxen, as pigs, you know, in the same list as horses and making these arguments of non-humanness by making an argument of animalness. But Joshua Bennett has combed through the eco-literature of our people and actually found that black folks did this incredible counterintuitive move of essentially being like, yeah, so what? We're all animals and not forsaking their kin in the field. So I'm gonna read a passage uh, that's also of course in Black Earth Wisdom that he, that he shared with me in his interview because I think it's quite stirring and, and challenging. He said, black lives as those that are often positioned as outside the human animal divide altogether and placed elsewhere in a zone of non-being where the kinds of extravagant violence so often deployed against and solely reserved for animals is made allowable, deemed necessary in order for white society to function at peak performance. But I say the animals are my kin, my truest kin, since we all belong to the earth. The lie of whiteness is that we can separate ourselves from the earth. But in considering animals as co-laborers, friends and partners in the field, black people resisted a social order predicated on confinement and open to a more radical sociality grounded in the desire for a world without cages or chains. It follows that prison and police abolition has environmentalist roots viewing human life as a part of all life on earth. So if this be true, right? Then the degradation of the earth is actually a manifestation of self-hatred. The abuse of animals is a manifestation of self-hatred because we are one. And what if we could see ourselves the way the divine body of the earth sees us? What if we could learn to love and emulate our elder siblings, the hawks, the black bears, and wolves in a practice of sacred biomimicry? So in summary, what Black Earth Wisdom is advocating for is that we rehydrate three habits of mind, reading the earth as sacred text, weaving ourselves back into kinship with the earth, and deferring to the earth as teacher. So earth as text, earth as kin, earth as teacher. And this practice is not going backwards, right? It's futuristic as much as it's ancient, right? We use the scientific method today, even though it's old, because it's a, it's a framework for novel experiments. And these core methodologies of earth listening, earth as text, earth as kin, earth as teacher, provide a framework for innovation. So Afro-indigeneity, Afro-indigenous philosophy is modern and continually evolving. And of course, we each have a role to play, right? We can deepen our own earth listening practice by learning how to read the earth once again, starting with the names of our neighbors, our beyond human neighbors, moving on to tree rings and weather patterns and soil structure and bird song. We can also give away resources and power to black and indigenous led ecological projects. So organizations like Girl Track, Outdoor Afro, Taproot Earth, Urban Ocean Lab, Rise St. James, National Black Food and Justice Alliance, on and on and on. And on a systems front, we need to support policies that advocate for land back, that take a stand for reparations and advocate for rights of nature. And there's so much learning you know, for us to do. So we can dive into black and indigenous eco-literature starting today. Um, three titles to get you started are Unbowed, All We Can Save, and As Long As the Grass Grows, and a long and growing list of Black eco projects and media and literature can be found um, on the blackearthwisdom.org website or using this short link, uh, bit.ly slash BEW23. It is case sensitive. So we, I am going to share with you um, at the very end of the Q&A this beautiful uh, poem. It's a video recording of my woman soul sister, Naima Peniman, who created a poem that summarizes the book and performs this in the video. It's about a five minute video. So we'll save that to the end just to leave a nice taste in your mouth. But just wanna say that, you know, my perspective is that in this time more than ever, perhaps we're really acutely aware of the fractures in our system of, of runaway consumption and corporate insatiability, right? We feel the hot winds of wildfire and the, the parchness of drought and the choked breath of the victims of state and community violence. And we know that there's no such thing as going back to normal. 
um, the path forward is gonna demand that we take our rightful place as the younger siblings in, in creation, deferring to the oceans as our teacher, the forest as our teacher, the mountains as our teacher. And so with that, I welcome you, dear ones, to share some questions and conversation, and then we'll, um, we'll close with the poem at the end. Thank you, Leah. That was amazing. So many connections. Thank yes, you. thank you so much. Um, I, I want to just take a moment so people know that the um, to ask a question, we'll want you to post in the in the chat on Zoom. So if you're unfamiliar with Zoom, you just want to click the chat bubble. If you don't see it, hit the little dot 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 more symbol, and the chat should come up. And you can go ahead and open that and write your question in. And Michael and myself are going to uh, pose those those questions to Leah. Do you want to go first, Michael? Sure. sure. So Leah, first question, um, what do you see as some creative ways forward for the African diaspora in the current climate crisis in terms of food resilience? Well, that's a huge question. So by African diaspora, meaning like black people everywhere in the world and food resilience? Is that you get a thumbs up for that? It sounds, I would, I'm just reading it as, as it was worded, but that's, that makes sense. That's a, I'm like, that's a huge question. I always have trouble with <laughs> predicting the future questions. I'm like, my goodness. But I will say that there's a lot of really hopeful things going on. You know, there's a, a, a global African women-led beekeepers, traditional beekeepers society um, that Beatrice Kamu is, is running that's like reviving that practice. And I mentioned that because it's just one symbol of a, a global diasporic um, reclamation of indigeneity and practice. There's also in the United States, though, they're doing some collaborations in the Caribbean, um, the Ujama Seed Project, which is led by my cousin, Bonetta Adib, that is, is reviving and reclaiming a lot of these uh, seeds that are, are at risk of being lost, our heirloom seeds, and, and getting farmers to grow them out and then distributing, distributing them through a, a, co a cooperative. So that's really exciting. Um, I tend to you know, like, I know it's grim. Like I know the food situation is really grim and I have to remind myself still that 70% of the calories that people eat, you know, in the global South are still coming from smallholders who are by and large doing sustainable growing if they have access to their land. So like we have the technologies and it's a matter of getting the boot off our neck of, of these corporate interests that are only interested in, in profit and not interested in, in the viability of, of life on earth. Uh, so we're a member of Via Campesina. That's like a global indigenous, not just black, but a global indigenous movement that's really working to um, resist corporate takeover of our, of our food system and hold on to our ancestral ways. So we're gonna just keep, we're gonna keep trying, you know, for as long as we have breath. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next question here. What is your favorite example or illustration <clears throat> of cooperative species interaction on your farm and in the world at large? Oh my goodness, I love this question. Okay, so first I'll tell you this joke. So I'm a science, like a scientist by training, but I end up getting asked to talk about racial justice all the time. So when someone asks me a science question, I like put a little, a little like point in this binder I have um, of happiness. So thank you for that. My favorite mutualism. Oh my goodness, there are so many. All right, I'm gonna say this one even though I can't remember the Latin names of these species, but essentially there are, there are ants that farm uh, fungi. Can anyone help me out with the Latin names of these species? But these farmer ants are really fascinating to me because they go ahead and, and clip leaves and farm the fungi. And the, and the fungi really benefit from this mutualism because they get to grow in these protected environments and be, be cared for and reproduce. And yet, um, you know, the ants are actually consuming, you know, consuming them as well. And I think that, that that's fascinating. We have a lot to learn from those ants. Um, that's not on my farm, that's in the tropics. On my farm, I mean, of course, it, it has to be uh, the, the relationship between rhizobial bacteria and the roots of, of legumes. So I mentioned this briefly when I talked about Dr. Carver, but um, legumes essentially say to the rhizobial bacteria, like, I have a nice little house for you in my roots and it's warm and protected. And I'll give you little bits of sugar that I made out of the sun and all you have to do in exchange, right, is live in these roots and breathe in nitrogen from the air 
and convert it into a nice organic form that I can absorb. And it's like a really good deal for both of them. And it's the reason that our, our soils can do what they do. So, I mean, that's, that's, I mean, I love pulling up like a bean plant. You can see the little nodules on the bottom of the, the roots and celebrate them. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So another question is, um, and I put a couple links in for some information on this, but interesting idea that humans use the same musical scales as birds and elephants. I wonder where the birds and elephants got their songs. Um. <laughs> I cannot answer that one. That's one of the <laughs> topical questions. But um, I did see someone was curious about the citations and that you responded with some links. Um, you know, the book is very well cited. So if you happen to pick up a copy of Black Earth Wisdom, even at your library, the citations are there. If you can't find them or don't want to pick up the book at the library, you can email me at love at soulfirefarm.org and I can pull them out uh, for you. But hopefully you, you get to enjoy the book. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Leah, how do you view your inclusion in the book, Why We Cook, Women on Food, Identity and Connection? Also, what influence did Chef Edna Lewis have on you, especially with her connection to the land and food movement? Thank you. Oh, thank you for that. So yeah, there's a, I didn't mention too much about it, but there's a wonderful um, chapter on home provisioning and sort of the key character in that chapter is Dr. Lenny Sorensen, um, who is uh, a devotee of the Edna Lewis tradition. Let's just say these are amazing uh, Black uh, women and femmes who are carrying on our home cookery traditions. And so if you haven't seen High on the Hog, the Netflix series, I really recommend it. Dr. Sorens that is in there and talks about um, not just the health benefits, but also these like deep cultural benefits of, of growing and making our food from scratch. And she does open hearth cookery, like literally cooks over a fire in cast iron and makes things, you know, from field to table which, you know, scientists, scientists, again, are catching up. And they're like, oh, wait, the thing that actually makes us healthy are whole unprocessed foods. Like that's the bottom line. <laughs> and so she's, she's reviving that tradition, but along with it, um, the cultural practice of elders and young people like cooking together and in doing so having an opportunity to be in relationship and having an opportunity for cultural transmission. Um, so there, yeah, there's a whole chapter in the book on, on cookery that really inspired me to not rush through the sacred process of nourishing my community. Great, thank you. The next question is uh, a few years ago, uh, when I, the, the questioner says, when I first became aware of your work, you listed a workshop called For White People Who Want to Help. Then COVID happened and so much shut down. Will you be running those workshops again? And if not, what, uh, can you tell us that is, was the gist of that workshop? Oh, yes, of course. So yeah, we have actually been running them online. Um, so they're called Uprooting Racism in the Food System. Um, and it's been very impactful. I think we've had several thousand people join this course um, over the past three years during the pandemic. And so what it consists of, is some of it is, it starts out with um, some pre-work that is an anti-oppression, anti-racism 101. So getting familiar with the various kinds of structural and institutional um, racism, a little bit of the history of how those, those racist ideas came about, uh, some looking at our own ancestry and our own story um, as it relates to race relations. So there's some pre-work and then the three hour course, uh, which we do together on Zoom, has a number of activities, including a, a really, a pretty neat, um, analysis of our own organizations in terms of how we're moving through our equity journey. So there's like a rubric and you get to fill it out and think about where you are and what steps you might take. Um, there's a, a going through our whole suggested actions. And, and then the post work is to, with your teammates who you join the course with, is to actually work on an action plan and get some feedback on the action plan. So um, we're running, I think we have three or four of those in the fall. The dates aren't out yet, but if you go to our website and click on the Uprooting Racism training, you can um, get on the list to be notified when registration opens for that. And I think we're opening a, like a level two this fall as well, um, if not the winter time. Thank you. Do you have any thoughts regarding land access and use in the reparations movement in the United States? 
Sure. I have lots of thoughts about the reparations movement. Okay. So I'll just start with, I'll start with this fun story because um, one of my elders, Ed Whitfield, he said, you know, people think reparations is a four letter word, but it's got a lot more letters than that. So he tells this story of, um, you know, our parable, I guess he said, you know, imagine your neighbor stole your cow and it did it in broad daylight. Everyone saw them do it. Um, and then comes back a couple of weeks later with remorse in their hearts and tears in their eyes being like, I'm really sorry I stole your cow. You know, I shouldn't have done that, um, but I'm going to make it up to you. Every week for the rest of the cow's life, I'm going to bring you a quarter pound of butter. I imagine your reaction would be something like mine, which is like, no, like give me my cow back. And so this parable is meant to represent the legacy of stolen land and exploited labor in this country. You know, the acres of land that were taken from indigenous people, also taken from black and brown community, the trillions of do dollars of unpaid labor. And, and that's not over. You know, like I mentioned earlier, 98% of the agricultural land in this country is white owned, 98%. Um, a white child born in the United States today is on average 13 times wealthier when they draw their first breath than a black child. And it's not because they were like, had a job in the womb, right? It's because wealth is inherited and almost all of it is traceable to stolen land and exploited labor. Uh, there's, there's much more to say about that. And, and my first book, Farming While Black, goes into quite a bit of that history um, of racism. So there, there, is, there is literally no way to have a just and equitable society without looking at giving back some of what was stolen. And that's what reparations is. It's the, it's the returning and the correction of harm. And there's, there are some pretty powerful initiatives around that. Um, for example, the National Black Food and Justice Alliance um, in collaboration with a bunch of us local folks it, are creating like a, a black commons. And so accepting donations in the spirit of reparations to, to purchase land um, and establish the black commons and also non-extractive credit and capital. Uh, the Black Farmer Fund of the Northeast is doing similar work with non-extractive capital and credit, and the Northeast Farmers of Land Northeast Farmers of Color Land Trust is an Indigenous Black collaboration working on lands back. Um, so there's a lot of grassroots in initiatives. You know, we've been trying to pass HR 40 for decades. I don't know for a really, really long time, which would just study reparations. It's not going anywhere. So I'm not putting the government off the hook. I think we have to do that. But in the meantime, there's a lot of things we can do as regular people. Um, to try to support the return of wealth and land to the people from whom it was stolen. Thank you. I'm going to preface this next question with just a, a, a welcome to everyone who is joining us from different parts of the world. We've had in our programs in recent months, people from every continent, which we're honored and really delighted to have. Thank you for this space. I am reaching this platform from Guam. My questions for new Black and Indigenous gardeners Farmers, what are programs you would refer for support and education for beginning a sustainable farm or backyard windowsill in your apartment options? Uh, Pre-work and space, and another one is pre-work and spaces to learn and become part of. And if you can't come to the farm, oh, this is awesome. This is a great, okay, so there's a lot. So yeah. first of all, person to just also email me, love at soulfirefarm.org, because I'm going to send you our, our resource kit. Um, that has a bunch of organizations. So one, we have every, everything from, we have a resource kit that has videos and how-to guides that have been created by Black and Indigenous community about gardening basics. Um, we also have a, an online uh, webinar series called our 3D um, Dynamic Deep Dives that teaches specific skills. So we have like a 3D on soil health that I just taught. We have like crop planting, we have beekeeping, we have mushrooms, and those are online. You can join from anywhere in the world. Um, but also a number of our partner organizations, I saw someone else shouted out, NEFO, the Northeast Farmers of Color Land Trust, they have Skillshares, Federation of Southern Cooperative. So there's a lot of things that are that are online. I don't know in Guam specifically what you can do in person. Like I don't know the orgs, but I can say generally, if you can find a community garden and ask the person who's oldest or who's been there the longest, if you can help them in their garden, you are going to learn so much. Um, and it and it really is also a gift to to our elders when we lean in and ask them, you know, to teach us and also offer our strong backs in service of, of their work. Um, but definitely reach out to me. I can, I can probably overwhelm you with, with links of online things, but yeah, see if you can find an elder in your community who knows what they're doing and, and give them a hand. Thank you. 
Thank you. And we're we're happy to send out in the follow-up email, Leah, the email address you're referencing. So don't worry if you missed that, anyone who's listening. I can type that in too. I just don't want to go searching through my Google Docs. To, I'll be just <laughs> that makes sense. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, am I missing questions here at the end, Michael? We might have just gone through most of them unless I have done it. Well, we have time for a few more if you all want, but we are going to stick around because we do want to show you this poem. It's pretty cool. Yeah, we um, can show it. And then if people have some anything final, they can put it in the chat. Should I go ahead and share it, Leah? Or Yeah, any last questions, folks, before we share our closing poem? I think we're good. Okay. Okay. Are you seeing it? Okay, I'm gonna play. Mama Nature told me, I am part of you. You are part of me. When we forgot, she remembered us. When we were lost, she found us. Mama Nature told me we have more than enough to go around. She showed me a glowing paper birch on the edge of the forest on a south-facing slope endowed to grow twice as big with all the sunlight it could ever drink. It could tower over, shade out the rest. It disperses its surplus sugars to boost the other trees instead. Could we be like that? Let go of excess practice fair distribution of sustenance regardless of what slope we were born on. Mama Nature taught me we are stronger together. She showed me the interspecies marriage of algae and fungi who fell in love across kingdoms, birthed a new life form capable of making home on stone, adept at staying alive in the harshest conditions. Could we be like that, join forces across difference, weave our powers, individual but undividable, in the midst of unthinkable circumstances, learn how to flourish together. Mama Nature taught me, blackness is precious and must be respected and must be protected from artificial light and must be tended. She showed me the indigo night, the miracle of starlight, the deep dark ocean, the rich black soils brimming with life. Mama Nature taught me nothing and no one is disposable. It all goes back to the cycle. She showed me there is no such thing as a way. Not for our waste heaped high in landfills or amassing in the Pacific. Not for our people deemed throwaway, warehoused in cages and open air prisons. There is no escaping the totality of this single beating earth. There is no mistaking all of us belong. Mama Nature told me you are made of the same matter as stardust remember your connection to everything. She showed me this animate force of existence pulsing all around us, doing everything in its power to regenerate life, even in death. She showed me a hollowed out tree still standing long dead, a hatchery for starlings, a porcupine den, a perch for owls, a hideout for bats, a food cache for chipmunks, a nuthatch's nest. Could we feel our ancestors' love like that? Palpable and present all around us, sheltering and nourishing us, supporting our flourishing. Could we be eternal? Mama Nature taught me, death energizes life. Life necessitates death. 
She showed me cypress seeds enclosed in cones, sealed shut with resin, the hardened shell, the trapped potential, the awakening flame, the wild inferno, the melting walls, the bursting open, the smoky wind, the scattered soaring, the free fall flight to fresh warm soil, the open sky, the widened space to grow and grow and grow. Could we be like that? Rising from devastation, preparing the way for the next stage of thriving. Mama Nature taught me transformation is inevitable. Adaption is essential. Change creates openings. She showed me how dolphins evolved dorsal fins to withstand the wild movement of the ocean how plants befriended fungi who helped them migrate out of water, who taught them how to grow roots, who showed them how to survive on scorched land, until together they transformed the atmosphere, built soil over stone, and patiently, unmistakably changed the entire world. Could we be like that? work together to do the unthinkable and shift the course of destiny. Mama Nature asked me, what will be your contribution? How will you partner with renewal to usher evolution? What are you willing to let go of? How are you willing to grow? Will you remember you are intrinsic to something bigger? What will you give rise to with a life force you've been given? Mama Nature asked me, can you hear me? And are you listening? That was beautiful. Well, thank you, everyone. I hope you enjoyed the poem. I will drop the link in the chat in case you want to watch it with others um, or just watch it again yourself. And also drop in a link where you can get Black Earth Wisdom if you're interested in having the book for yourself. Uh, I hope you are. And I wish you all a very joyous Earth Day, uh, rest of your, your wonderful Earth Day. Uh, thank you so much, Leah, for sharing with us this evening. And to everyone for joining us um, and sharing this beautiful and inspiring event on Earth Day. Yeah, certainly. We we wish you a very safe and healthy Earth Day every day to you. And really, thank you, Leah. This has been a really beautiful time and way to celebrate the day. Wow, and so much gratitude in the chat. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. You're so warm and generous. Really appreciate y'all. See you later. Bye. Bye.